Hello folks, Larry here with Curio Mechanics. Thanks for clicking on my video. Are you tired of a slow computer? Are you tired of being asked to log in just to play solitaire? Did the latest update scramble your SSD? Do other computers kick sand in your computer's face when you go to the beach? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then this video is for you. In today's video, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine named Tux. Tux is the mascot for an ever-growing operating system known as Linux, which is short for Little Unix. You've probably heard of it. You've also probably heard it's complicated and hard to learn. I'm happy to report that this is no longer the case. A very large community of developers have worked hard to bring you a free operating system that is easy to use and runs on a potato with ease. Let's take a look at it. Let's start with how to try this wonderful system out. The good news is that you can try it first without making the commitment to using it if you don't want to. This is called the live environment and runs from a common USB stick. In order to get started, you will need a computer with internet and a USB stick that you don't mind getting wiped during the process. Linux comes in many flavors called distributions. For today's video, I'm going to recommend one called Debian 13 using the KDE desktop. Don't worry if that doesn't mean anything to you. I'm going to walk you through it step by step. One of the key design philosophies behind Debian is that it is rock solid and completely free. Start by bringing up a browser and googling Debian 13 download. Then on the right side, click on the link that says Live KDE. If you're coming from an Apple background, GNOME might be a more comfortable choice, but I'm going to assume for this video that you are most comfortable with Windows. Since we are not permanently installing any of the versions yet, you can feel free to try as many live distributions as you like, but I think KDE will have the easiest learning curve. When you click the link, it will start a rather large download. Just let it cook along. We will need to download one more thing called Belena Etcher. Simply do another Google search for that download and get that at the same time. Click the link that corresponds to the operating system of the computer you're going to use to create the USB stick. You can make the USB on any computer you like and it doesn't have to be the same machine you want to try Linux on. After the Belena insta installer finishes downloading, double click the file to install the program. We're now ready to create our USB stick once the live ISO finishes downloading. There are many other flavors of Linux to choose from depending on what your needs are. If you think you'll need professional support, Ubuntu is the name of another popular flavor. Be aware though that this will cost money. There is a version called Ubuntu Pro that comes with technical support for critical infrastructure. There are also versions of Ubuntu called LTS for long-term support that will continue to re receive security updates and patches for at least five years. This is different that the latest version of Ubuntu is updated more often. Chris from Explaining Computers did a fantastic video showing some other versions of Linux and comparing them. I'll put a link to that video in the description box. Once the downloads are finished, creating the USB stick is a piece of cake. Simply put the USB stick in your computer, launch Belena, then on the left click From File and browse to where you saved the Debian ISO file. Make sure the OS Images filter is selected and it will show you just what you can flash to the USB stick. Once you've picked that file, verify the USB stick is selected in the middle or hit Change. It will try to ensure you don't accidentally step on your computer's hard drives. Finally, click Flash, OK to the warning, then let it run its course to create the image you need to boot from the USB drive into a live version of Linux. 
As a reminder, a live version means it will run directly from the USB stick and not be installed to your hard drive. If you like it, there will be an install option that allows you to move it to your computer storage permanently. The key benefit to this is that an internal storage drive will be much faster than running from a USB stick. Keep this in mind when you're trying out Linux. If it doesn't feel very snappy, it's because of the slower access times of external storage. Once the Belena process is finished, you're almost ready to start up your computer and meet Tux. Put the USB stick into the computer you want to use and turn it on. If your computer boots back into your existing operating system, you may need to check with your computer's specific BIOS settings to verify that it's set to boot to a USB before booting to the hard drive. A quick visit Google or visit to your manufacturer's support site should give you the steps needed to make this change. It's really pretty easy, but each computer is slightly different, so I can't give you the exact steps. There is tons of information on the web on how to set up USB booting. Now that we're running Linux, you'll notice the button in the lower left of your screen is a start menu that works just like previous versions of Windows. The programs that are installed are sorted by category, but there's also an all applications if you want to see the whole list at once. The system and utilities category contains most of the settings you'll need that let you make sure everything is up and running correctly. If you want to install new software, there is a program called Discover, or you can find a number of software managers on the start menu. I'd recommend using one of these software managers because it will only show things that are set up to work correctly with your particular flavor of Linux. You shouldn't be able to hurt out anything, but your new friend Tux can do the hard work for you. You can either search by category from the main page or use the search function to select the exact program you're looking for. Not everything you're searching for may show up, but we can get to alternate ways to install stuff in later episodes. For now, I'm just walking you through the basic basics. When you find the program, simply click on the search result, then click install, and let Tux do the rest. There will be a new icon added to your start menu automatically for almost every program. Another common task is tweaking the way your system looks and behaves. The third icon from the left is System Settings and has almost everything you need to tweak things to your heart's content. Just click the category on the left, then the optional options will be shown on the right. You can change your display resolution from here for instance, you can connect to a Wi-Fi from the networking area if you need to, Another thing that I always change is to turn off the default behavior of kicking you back to the login screen after five minutes of inactivity. Like any settings window, make sure you click apply when you've made your changes. You'll notice I have my windows wobble when moved and blow apart when closed. These are some other things you can configure in the system settings. Because Tux already has so many friends, Anything you want to learn how to do is a quick Google away. In the internet section of your start menu are all of the browsers you have installed to get you on the information superhighway. I prefer Firefox, but the choice is up to you. There are a wide range of options available. There is also built-in help on the start menu, helpfully labeled Help. At the top right corner are the window controls. They look a little different, but are the same controls that are in Windows. Minimize, maximize, and close. The down arrow will move the window down to your taskbar. Left clicking it in the taskbar will bring it back up. The up arrow or diamond in the middle will change between making the window filling your full screen and being smaller and resizable. The X in the upper right will actually stop the program from running and close it. One of the most important things to know is how to launch Solitaire. Click the start button on the lower right, on the lower left, sorry, then choose the games category, then I'll Riot Solitaire. Presto! I would mention that I use Steam and that allows most Windows only games to run just fine in Linux. 
I've had really good luck playing with both past and current titles with proper graphics card acceleration drivers, and as Tux continues to make more friends, it's becoming easier every day to run games. If you click the file folder down on the start bar, you'll launch a file browser that looks and feels pretty familiar. You'll find some common categories to help you sort your files. Linux, by default, uses a directory called Home for each user to store and sort your files. This is your playground and has the least restrictive permissions. I'll get more into file permissions in future episodes, but unless you're trying to change something or run a system level program, double clicking the file will open it in the appropriate piece of software. Like Windows, you can also right click on a file to get a list of appropriate actions. Most navigation tasks, including Control C to copy, Control X to cut, and Control V to paste. Unlike Windows, however, there is a wealth of different file browsers to try if you don't like the defaults. Down in the tray on the lower right is a speaker icon. You can click on that to change the system volume. There are two tabs to either control your standard sound output or hit the other tab to do it on a program by program basis. There are also lots of other little useful icons down there that you can fiddle with to do things like see system notifications and eject removable media for instance. One gotcha to mention is that applications that produce sound have a little speaker in the upper right of their icons on the taskbar. You can mute each one separately by clicking that speaker. So if it seems like a program suddenly went silent, make sure you didn't mute it by accident. The Documents folder should be the place you store your general purpose files. Its sole purpose is to let each user keep their stuff. To be completely honest though, I'm not 100% certain that a live environment will look exactly like the folder structure I'm showing here. Sometimes, down in the lower right area, an icon may appear that says Updates Available. If it shows up, go ahead and left click on it. That will open a window that shows the software it will update. You can uncheck any of the listings, but I wouldn't recommend that. Go ahead and click Apply Updates. That will pop up a window asking for your password. This is basically Tux warning you that you're trying to do something that may affect the system. It's asking for your login password. This is a standard safety net built into Linux that will do everything it can to protect itself from outside harm or inadvertent changes. Permissions have a long and rich history in Unix, and I'll just say for now that it's one of the mechanisms that helps make Linux so secure and stable. As I've said earlier, we'll get deeper into the subject of permissions in a future video. It can get pretty powerful when used properly. Don't worry, not complicated, just powerful. Well, this is above the level I'm shooting for in this easy start guide. I want to simply show you that if you're worried about running into something that is absolutely critical and just doesn't work on Linux, there are pieces of software that exist called virtual machines that let you essentially run a program that makes a computer in your computer. It's a container that you can install Windows to and it will run your desktop just like any other program. Windows thinks it's installed on a regular computer and will behave just like it always does. You can actually run almost any operating system inside of a virtual machine and this is really common in the business world. This will let you have a fallback plan if you need to work outside the boundaries of Linux. Setting these up are a bit more complex, but I wanted to just mention it so that you know it exists. The last subject I'll cover today is productivity. Debian has many options to do the daily office work. There are email clients and a suite of programs that are compatible with Windows Office files called LibreOffice. It has programs that mimic Access, Excel, PowerPoint, and Word. You can either open existing MS Office files or create them from scratch. It covers a wider range of Office versions than Office itself. 
While the interface is slightly different, if you're comfortable in MS Office, you'll pick up LibreOffice in no time. Like any well-behaved software, if you try to close it without saving changes, it will prompt you. You can use the file dialog to choose from a long list of file formats. So there you have it, a short introduction into what I think will become the operating system of the future. As Linux keeps getting easier to use, and other choices keep getting more annoying, I see the user base growing quite a bit. I've used it personally since about 2000, and the footage was captured on my daily driver computer. I used to use the analogy that Linux was like getting a Corvette, but it was shipped in a kit and you had to assemble it yourself with no instructions. Those days are behind us. There is a fantastic community of very smart people who've made it accessible to the everyday user and the amount of polish and security have made it stand the test of time. I hope you'll consider giving it a try if you can. I think you'll like my friend Tux. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I will continue to follow up in the future with some more tutorials that I hope will continue to be easily digestible. Enjoy your day.